What is up? And welcome back to Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silvers. As always, I am your host, Brandon Silvers. Do you know what time it is? Yeah, yeah, it is time to subscribe, rate, review, and share. But actually, what I'm talking about is it's time for the second annual Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silvers NBA preview. I reviewed the tape of last year's preview so I can be even better at this because, you know, that's what I do. No need to thank me. And I realize that there's one way to do this that's better than all the rest. More reliable, more scientific, more accurate, all that. And that's using what we in the business call the eye test. That's right. I'm going to break down each team splitting the videos up by division using what my eyeballs tell me. What do I love? What do I hate? And most importantly, could they possibly see an NBA title this season? So let's get into it. Let's start off our look at the Central Division with the Chicago Bulls. Billy Donovan and friends went 40 and 42 last season and lost in the play in to the eventual Eastern Conference champion Miami Heat. Ah, so close. Vegas thinks they get further away this year and have set their over under at 37 and a half wins. I'm the expert here though, so what do I love about this Bulls team? Okay, I already mentioned it, but they almost made it into the playoffs last year thanks to DeMar DeRozan's daughter. And again, that seems like, okay, whatever. But the team they lost to ended up going to the NBA Finals. Would the Bulls have done that? Probably not. But in addition to this essentially being the same squad from last year, it's also basically the same core group from two years ago that won 46 games. They still feature not one but two, 25, five, and five wings in Zach Levine and DeMar DeRozan. DeMar is a dog who would have been more appreciated in the previous era when mid-range jumpers were still a thing, but to be doing what he's doing in this era at this age is incredible. It felt like he was going to ride off into the sunset with some bad Spurs teams, but then he gets to Chicago and has some of the best seasons of his entire career. I don't know if I just haven't mentally adjusted to the increased longevity in sports yet, but it shocked the hell out of me. If you've seen Zach Levine in the dunk contest, you know he's one of the most athletically gifted players ever. He can also shoot it, and I watched him deliver one of the craziest fuck you performances against his own coach at the time, Jim Boylan, when he dropped 49 against the Hornets a couple years ago, including a million three-pointers and the game winner. There aren't many players ever who could have had a game like that. Zach did, and he's on the Bulls. I feel like I remember another guy who could have done that who also played here too. It's very hard for me to get through these previews without mentioning former Lakers, and I am still pissed that we let Alex Caruso walk, but my misery is their gain, I guess. The most athletic white male pattern baldness victim in NBA history, he's also a lockdown perimeter defender. Imagine having all that and the original Nikola in Nikola Vucevic. He'll never be mistaken for the Joker at this point, but he's still an all-star level talent who will give you nearly 20 points, 10 rebounds, and three assists a game. And he played in all 82 games last year, which has to be some sort of record in today's NBA. You look at all of this and think, damn, this feels a hell of a lot more like that 46 win team than it does the 37 or so win team that Vegas has in mind. So what's the problem? More importantly, what do I hate about him? Well, the main difference between that 46 win team and this one is Lonzo Ball, specifically a lack of Lonzo Ball. He went down with a knee injury in the middle of that 46 win season and the Bulls haven't looked the same since and more concerning, he hasn't played since. The big baller controversy over the summer was Lonzo's back and forth with Stephen A. Smith about Stephen A.'s reporting on his injury. This may come as a shock to people who keep up with Stephen A., but he might have exaggerated how severe Lonzo's condition was. But does he look like he was wrong about the effects it could have on Lonzo's career? I have not seen any videos of Lonzo that would lead me to believe that he's coming back to play basketball, particularly at the level he was playing at anytime soon, if ever. I'm not a medical doctor, I'm merely licensed to do NBA eye tests, but none of the footage Lonzo has put out looks particularly healthy. He looks hurt, and I hate that for the Bulls and for Lonzo. Lonzo caught all kinds of hell coming into the league thanks to his dad, but he dealt with all of it in a professional way and developed into a pretty good basketball player as well. He had incredible court vision, was a great perimeter defender, and his infamous jumper was becoming more and more consistent. He wasn't going to make good on his dad's predictions, but who cares? Nobody could have, but he absolutely was on his way to being a borderline all-star 
and an important piece of an Eastern Conference contender, and it stinks that it didn't happen, and now we don't know if it ever will. This is not the same Bulls team without him, and none of the replacements they have tried have worked out either. Caruso is not a starting point guard. He's a bench guy who can defend. Kobe White is a better option than Caruso and has way more potential, but he's nowhere near the playmaker Lonzo was, and he's not really lived up to what the Bulls thought they were getting when they drafted him. Speaking of that, Ayo DeSumo was talked about as having some point guard skills coming out of college as well, but they've already given up on that. There's nothing really here on this roster. For my money, DeMar DeRozan is their best player, but how many years does he have left, even with guys playing longer? How much more effective can he be? Then there's Levine, who's this generation's Vince Carter. All-world athleticism, a beautiful jumper, unlimited range, everything you need to be an unguardable two-guard, but he makes himself incredibly guardable by firing up bad three after bad three and refusing to use that athleticism to get to the hoop. He needs to be featured as the number one guy on offense to be effective, but he's not good enough to be the number one guy on a great team. He seems to try to cover this up by making his teammates focus on how much they hate playing with him instead. And with good reason, because like Vince back in the day, he'll have long stretches where he looks completely disinterested out there on the court, only coming to when he realizes it's been two minutes since he got a shot up. What's here that you actually like, especially when you're looking ahead to the future? They haven't drafted well, like I said, Kobe White and Io are bench guys. Patrick Williams is probably the best of their recent picks, but is he what you're expecting out of a number four? They need more shooting, and they drafted a kid who shot 24% from three in college. Do they even have scouts? All right, enough. Let's discuss their eye test. All right, look, we all know the Bulls aren't seeing a championship this year. Might as well fire up the last dance again and watch that instead. It's time to blow this team up, okay? Levine needs to be moved. DeRozan needs to be moved. And he should actually be easier to move than Levine thanks to his expiring contract. I mean, while we're doing all this, Vooch can probably be moved too. It's time to lose and lose hard. Play the young guys. Squeeze as much development as you can out of them. But most importantly, lose lose hard lose fast lose a lot if they come close to that 37 and a half win mark they need to fire the entire coaching staff in front office if i'm talking about levine and derozan on this team again next year they need to fire the entire coaching staff in front office do the right thing please all right moving on cleveland cavaliers J.B. Bickerstaff is back after last year's team went 51-31. and 31. Vegas has them close to that again with an over-under set at 50 and a half wins. I liked them last year. What do I love about them heading into this season? I wasn't sure how Donovan Mitchell would look here, so naturally he went out and averaged a career-high 28.3 points per game, including a monster 71-point outing. My concern with him is always the streakiness of his shot, but his field goal percentage was a career high by 3.5%, his three-point shooting percentage tied a career high on more volume, and his free throw percentage was also a career high. He's entering what should be his peak years, and 28-4-4 is one hell of a peak for the next three or four years. At 27, he's the oldest of a talented core group that includes an all-star level talent at point guard in Darius Garland, who can give you 21 points and 7 or 8 assists on 41% shooting from 3, and two of the best defensive big men in the league in Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, who combined for 30 points, 19 rebounds, and 3 blocks a game. In just two seasons, Mobley has shown why he was the third pick in his draft. You knew he was going to bring defense from the jump, but his offense has progressed quickly as well. He doesn't have much range on his shot yet, but he can be used in a lot of different ways on that end that lets the Cavs vary their lineups. He's got more than enough size to play the five, or you can slide him over to the four and have him play beside Allen. If that jump shot turns into anything, he's going to be a real problem. He's already a Defensive Player of the Year candidate, and he's well on his way to becoming an all-star too. How great can he be? Can he be an all-NBA guy as the jumper and post-game develop? This is one of the best defensive teams in the league, thanks to him, Jared Allen, and Darius Garland. When you look at the young guards in this league who are comparable offensively to Garland, how many of them can defend at his level? Don't worry, I'll wait. They also added much-needed shooting in the form of this generation's Dan Marley, a.k.a. Max Struess. I think he was asked to do too much in Miami last season, and his efficiency will go up being surrounded by so much offensive talent. I mean, geez, with all that, what could I possibly hate about this team? Well, with as much offensive talent as they have, it's wild how hard they have to work to score sometimes. This is a major reason why they lost to a Knicks team with less talent in five games in last year's first round. 
When they struggle to score, Donovan Mitchell defaults to hero ball Donovan Mitchell. While he had the best offensive season of his career in the regular season, it's too easy to shut down a 6-1 scorer with an inconsistent three-pointer who is also thinking shoot it first, second, and third. The only game they won in that series, he was a facilitator on offense, finishing with 13 assists. As great as he was last year, I'm still not sold on their ceiling with him as the focal point on offense. These problems are made worse the longer it takes for Mobley to develop a jump shot if he ever does. Until then, you have him and Jared Allen, who only dunks, clogging up the paint so opposing teams can limit Mitchell's drives and force him to take those jumpers that are so hot and cold. It's almost like he's playing with two Rudy Gobert's now in terms of spacing. How did that work out in Utah? Now, one solution could be trading away one of the bigs, specifically Jared Allen, but what does that get you? Wait, Tristan Thompson is back on the roster? Why? Is he going to make this team? Who looked around and thought they needed him? Did they hire Chris Kardashian as GM? I just spent all that time telling you they have a problem with bigs who can't score away from the basket and clog the paint, and they brought in Tristan Thompson? He's worse defensively than the other two by leaps and bounds. Offensively, as I've mentioned on here before, he's so bad that they've had him try to switch shooting hands. Do you know how badly you have to shoot for someone to look at you and say, are you sure? You're left-handed. You know those novelty giant size hats that Brian Robinson of the Commanders made famous last year? Just a huge version of a regular hat. Tristan uses that same technology to make his mouth guards. I'm trying really hard to take this team seriously, but did they bring in George Niang too? Why? I looked up his basketball reference page and it says he hit 40% of his threes and I kept thinking one of those community notes from Twitter was going to pop up with the correct percentage because I've never seen him do such a thing. An absolutely awful defensive player who refuses to get into shape. I gotta be honest, I don't know what the regional food in Cleveland is, but I know George is gonna find out very soon if he hasn't already. If you needed any more proof that wealth and intellect have no correlation whatsoever, this team is owned by a man who wrote LeBron James a very public letter using Comic Sans font. Everything Joachim Noah said was right and LeBron knew it and that's why he left the first time. All right, let's move on to the results of the eye test. Will Cleveland see a title this year? No, but I do think they will have another great season. Unfortunately, they just don't have enough to push them into that title contender stratosphere. They honestly remind me of those Cavs teams from the Bulls' first three-peat, where they have a lot of talent and they're going to win a bunch of games, maybe even make the conference finals, but they don't have that one superstar who's going to put them over the top. If you're a Cavs fan, instead of getting your hopes up for a title this year, save that hope for another LeBron reunion where he brings along Ronnie. Moving on to the Motor City and the Detroit Pistons. All right, rough one last year, went 17 and 65. Dwayne Casey is gone and Monty Williams is the new head coach for a lot of money. He took the Suns to the 2021 finals and was NBA coach of the year the following season. Vegas has set the over under at 28 and a half wins. What do I love about the Pistons? Okay, you have to think based on the Williams hiring alone, this organization is having serious thoughts about winning in the very near future. It would be wild to make someone the highest paid coach in the league just to have him come in and continue to lose. He has experience navigating all kinds of situations and a six-year deal seems to indicate that they're going to let him do his thing. He helped New Orleans transition from losing Chris Paul to developing Anthony Davis and getting back to the playoffs. He also took a Phoenix team that won 19 games the year before he was hired and got them to the finals in two seasons. Basically did it in reverse by adding Chris Paul this time. Now, will he have all the talent here that he had there? No, not necessarily, but he has more to work with than you think. A big reason this team struggled so much last season is they only had Cade Cunningham for 12 games. In those 12 games, he looked like a legit 27-7 and guy, but it's hard to say what they really have in him because he hadn't had many healthy stretches in his two seasons so far, but in the flashes we've seen where he is healthy, he's looked pretty good. Even more good news is he looked like one of the best players over the summer at Team USA camp, and he would have played in the FIBA World Cup, but he decided against it so that he'd be healthy and fresh to start the season. 
They have a mix of talent around him that includes young guys and vets. Boyan Bogdanovich led this team last year after Cade went down, averaging 21 points on 41% from three. They must have liked that because they brought in even more veteran three-point shooters in the offseason. Alec Burks, who will most likely be Boyan's backup, was put on earth to score a lot of points in a short amount of time. He's been over 40% from three the past three seasons. Monty Morris is a solid playmaking point guard who will come off the bench, and he's a 39% three-point shooter for his career. Joe Harris is the best pure shooter of the bunch who, despite untimely slumps, is a career 43% guy from three. So clearly they had an agenda going into this offseason. If you can remember when Twitter first came out and hit threes, the Pistons wanted to sign you. Still waiting on my phone call though. Their young guys are super intriguing. You look at them and you're like, hmm, you know what? Maybe. Jalen Duran should be their starting center this year. He averaged nine points and nine boards last year while starting in about half of his games. He doesn't turn 20 until November. You know he'll figure out how to be a great defender as he plays more. The question is, how does he end up looking on offense? How does he pair with Cade? I rarely expect anybody to develop a jumper, especially big guys, but can he develop consistent offensive moves? His offensive potential to me is anywhere from Clint Capella to Orlando Dwight Howard. Then there's Jaden Ivey, who had to do a lot more than I imagine they wanted him to do, and he struggled at times because of it, but who also reminds me of pre-injury Victor Oladipo, who took a while to figure things out, but eventually became an all-star. They're saying he's probably going to come off the bench, and I think that's going to be a great role for him at this point in his career. Why stop with the early 2010 comps? Rookie Asar Thompson is an elite, elite athlete with playmaking skills who can and will defend. He reminds me of the next evolution of Philly Andre Iguodala. You can see what they're trying to do and how it's coming together. So what do I hate about them? Y'all thought I was joking when I said I was waiting on my phone call from them, but Joe Harris shot one for 12 from three in the playoffs last year for Brooklyn, and I could absolutely do that. I want you to think of basketball coaches you've seen in TV shows aimed at tweens and young teens. Reggie Theus' character in Hangtime is the first one who came to mind for me. Monty Williams coaches like he's auditioning for one of those roles. Are they really still doing the Killian Hayes thing? 38% from the field, 27% from three, two turnovers a game for his career, and the numbers don't even tell the full story. Enough is enough. That mid-2000s team was not a dynasty, no matter how badly you want it to be. It also ruined basketball. Nobody wants to see a bunch of 81 to 73 games. Also, the malice at the Palace was entirely their fault. Ben Wallace started it, their fan threw the beer, their other fans tried to fight, but everyone wants to be mad at the Pacers. They ruined Grant Hill by letting him play through that ankle injury. He was going to be an all-time great, and they ruined him because they knew he was going to leave as a free agent. Without Isaiah Thomas, Bill Lambeer would have been the Brad Miller of his era. They're so bad and have been bad for so long that I actually had to work for reasons to hate them. Mostly, I just feel pity. Let's just move on to the eye test. Will they be seeing a championship this year? Yes, if every other team in the league spontaneously can bust right now. This is not a serious question. They're seeing eye dog needs glasses. I like what they're trying to build. I see the vision. I still think they're a ways away though. As far as title contention, who on this roster projects as being good enough to be the number one guy on a potential championship team? Even with what we've seen from healthy Cade, he's only looked like a guy who can lead a team to a top four seed in the East at his best. I say only, like that's a bad thing. It's obviously not. But superstars win rings, and I don't think there's one on this roster right now. I guess the hope is they find one in the next draft or two, or a couple of the young guys already here develop enough to put together a nice package for the next disgruntled superstar. And that disgruntled superstar actually wants to play in Detroit? I don't know. A 30-win season would be incredible this year, but the development of their young guy should be the main barometer of success. Good luck. Hey gang, it's Indiana Pacer time. They were 35-47 and 47 under Rick Carlisle last year. I like the thought of him just cycling between the Pacers, Pistons, and Mavs. Vegas doesn't think there's much of a change this year and has set the over-under at 38 and a half wins. But what do I think? And more importantly, what do I love about the Indiana Pacers? This was actually a playoff team at one point last season. Did you forget that? 
Don't worry, we all did. But for a portion of the year, they were the Sacramento Kings of the East. A big reason for that was Tyrese Halliburton, who they got the previous season from the Sacramento Kings of the West. His first full season as the lead guy led to his first ever All-Star appearance with averages of 21 points and 10 assists on 40% from three on just 15 shots a game. He went down with an injury right before the All-Star break, and that basically ended their playoff hopes, which shows you exactly how important he is for what they do. Their other young guy who is super exciting is Benedict Matherin. He came in and was ready to score immediately, just a high-flying, explosive player. They have a lot of wing depth with Buddy Heald, Charleston's own Aaron Neesmith, who showed he can defend, and if his jumper ever looks like it did at Vandy, look out. Newly signed NBA champion Bruce Brown and rookie Ben Shepard, who shot the lights out in college and in the preseason so far. I'm curious to see how they look as Carlisle develops their rotation. They each offer something different, and nobody is head and shoulders above anybody else, so it should be a lot of mixing and matching to see which group works the best. Andrew Nimhard plays enough of the one to make TJ McConnell expendable. He's a solid playmaker, a great defender, great size for a point guard too, especially compared to TJ. Miles Turner, despite being in like every trade rumor ever for the past five years, is still here, and he thrived alongside Halliburton. Burton, a career high in points per game with 18, which is like three and a half more than his previous career high, and a career high in field goal percentage at nearly 55%. He's only been above 50% two other seasons, and he's still bringing that great shot blocking and defense that we've known him for. This is a nice little team they've put together, and I'm excited to see what they can do with a full season of Tyrese leading the way, but what do I hate about him? They brought in Obi Toppin from the Knicks in a move I think will end up being completely useless. He's very athletic, yes, but I don't trust his jump shot and his basketball instincts just seem off to me. They should have traded Miles Turner a long time ago. They've wasted everyone's time by not doing it. They could have gotten a lot more for him back when his potential was the big selling point. As he's fulfilled his potential, it's been fine, but not nearly what it looked like it could be. And they're about to repeat that same exact mistake with Buddy Heald. Buddy doesn't wanna be here. He's gonna turn 31 in December. He's a great shooter, but what else? Get rid of him now. The way this franchise has treated South Carolinian Jermaine O'Neal is a travesty. He got to the Pacers as their finals team that lost to the Lakers was falling apart, and he helped hold it together by becoming one of the best two-way big men in the league. He was an all-star, he won most improved player, and basically carried them post Reggie Miller's prime, and they act like he doesn't exist because the malice at the Palace happened. They had the best record in the league the year before it happened, and they had gone to the Eastern Conference Finals. They looked ready to make the leap to the finals that year when it all went down, but a Pistons fan picked the least mentally stable player in the league at the time to throw a beer at. They act like it's Jermaine's fault. God forbid Jermaine throw punches in an unprecedented brawl that was complete chaos. And on top of all that, he served his suspension that year and led them to a first round playoff upset, even though they basically had nothing left and he had a sprained shoulder. But they have to pretend he doesn't exist because he embarrassed them in some way that nobody cares about anymore. It's pathetic. This franchise also traded Kawhi for George Hill, and if their fans had gotten their wish, they would have drafted Steve Alford over Reggie Miller. They also subjected the world to the shaved heads of Chris Mullen and Rick Smiths. Finally, none of those Paul George teams were good enough to beat the Miami Heat. Let's quit pretending. All right, let's move on to the results of the eye test. Certainly, no title in 2024, no surprise there, but this is an intriguing team, especially if they're healthy. I was shocked to see that Vegas over-under set at 38 and a half. This was a team that was on pace to win 46 games at the halfway point of last season before Halliburton got hurt. I could see them getting over that 40 win mark and even fighting for a play-in spot. Another season of development from guys like Matherin and Neesmith, along with the Bruce Brown signing, could be huge for what they're doing on the wings, and I've already gone on and on about Halliburton and Turner. The big question mark is what they're going to do with Buddy and obviously what the return looks like if and when they move him, but this core is young and talented. They're headed in the right direction. Let's finish up with the Milwaukee Bucks. This team won 58 games last year, but had a disappointing first round exit, largely due to injuries. Vegas has set the over under for this season at 54 and a half wins for new coach Adrian Griffin. Is there anything else new with them? Let's talk about what I love about them and see. 
All right, we've had a couple weeks to digest the Dame Lillard trade and have seen enough in preseason where I'm even more excited by the possibilities. This is just a terrific pairing in terms of having two stars who can cover for each other's weaknesses. Giannis is one of the hardest guys to stop from getting to the hoop in NBA history. He's an all-time great, two-time MVP champion, and he averaged a career-high 31 points per game last season. The only real weakness in his game is shooting either from the perimeter or the free throw line. This can make him easy, relatively speaking, to guard in the playoffs and during crunch time. He's been at his best when he's had a guy who can score from the perimeter and isn't worried about going to the free throw line beside him. Enter Dame Lillard. He also averaged a career high in points per game last year with 32, and he's made a name for himself hitting big time shot after big time shot. He's a career 90% free throw shooter, and he isn't afraid to have the ball in his hands at the end of games. He's also a career 37% shooter from three, and that percentage feels like it doubles at the end of close games. The big question marks with him is that it's hard for a 6'2 guy to be the man on an NBA title contender. There's been one in 30 years, and his name is Steph Curry, and he struggles defensively, which is where we point right back to 6'11", perennial all-defensive team guy in Giannis. How do you defend a Dame Giannis pick and roll? What do you do? I hope we see it a million times this year. That's all I would call if I were Adrian Griffin. I mean, even a Dame Brooke Lopez pick and roll is hard enough to figure out. I'm always talking about former Lakers. What I would give to have this guy back. Also, what a strange career. Talk about reinventing yourself. Through the first eight seasons of his career, he shot 31 three-pointers. 31 three-point attempts in eight years. And he was playing 30 minutes a game and scoring 20 points a night. It wasn't like he was some dude who was at the end of the bench. He went from attempting 31 total over eight seasons to a guy who hit 136 last season alone on 37%, same as Dame, on less volume, and he's a seven-footer. Also, if Giannis wasn't enough of a defensive threat to help clean up some of Dame's mistakes on that end, Brooke is one of the best defenders in the league in his own right. He finished second in last season's Defensive Player of the Year voting. And there's two of them. Well, not literally, but his twin Robin is here too. Certainly not the offensive threat that Brooke is, but a high energy defensive guy off the bench who will give you at least three moments each year where he absolutely loses his shit at someone and looks like an absolute madman. Speaking of madmen, Crazy Eyes Bobby Portis is still here too to knock down threes, rebound, and be a fan favorite. And I haven't even mentioned Charleston native Chris Middleton, who played the role of perimeter guy for Giannis when they won the championship. This is one hell of a team, including including the best duo in the NBA. So what do I hate? Let's start with Middleton. I took so long to mention him because he hasn't been the same guy since he hurt his knee. He started coming around offensively in the playoffs, which is great, but he also used to be a great perimeter defender and showed no signs of that at all. In that disappointing first round exit last year, Jimmy Butler averaged 37.6 points per game, including a 56 point and 42 point game to close out the series. Unfortunately, most of the blame for that performance was Chris's fault. Now we had the off season to try to get right again, but if his defense isn't back, then you've got two guys in him and Dame who you have to cover for defensively, which is a lot to ask even when you have Giannis and Brook. They've also managed to fill this roster out with incredibly unlikable bench players. However much I would give to have Brook back on the Lakers, I'd give double to make sure Malik Beasley never came back and he was only there for 26 games, including the playoffs. He was said to be a shooter and at 36% from three over his career, you wanna believe it, but what they don't tell you is that he gets to that 36% by alternating between games where he goes three for four and games where he goes 0 for five. Then he'll switch to mostly 0 for five games in the playoffs. Campaign, oh campaign. He was in the league because Russell Westbrook enjoyed having him as a dance partner on OKC's bench. He was out of the league because of how he played. And then he was back in the league when Phoenix realized Chris Paul couldn't play 40 minutes a game and they had no cap room. I think he's just trying to make as much money as possible until he has to go back to playing Bucky and Fat Albert. Well, would you look at that? Jay Crowder's back. Mr. All Caps Boss Man 99 on social media. He played great in limited time last year for the Bucks, and this will lead to him once again thinking thinking he's got the talent to be the number one guy and he'll go back to bricking three after three after three, no matter how wide open he is. One of the fakest tough guys in the league and I'll be praying that he pisses off Bobby Portis and Robin Lopez in practice. 
Then there's Thanasis Antetokounmpo. I don't typically hate people for being too happy, but when I do, it's usually Thanasis. No real basketball skill, can't dribble, can't shoot, can't defend without fouling, just Giannis's brother only gets in the game to let you know it's over. They also signed another Giannis brother, and I can't imagine how bad he must be. If he can't even be on the bench with the Nasus, he's gotta go to the G League. Which brings me to Dame and Giannis. Perfect on-court compliments of each other, identical guys off it. Both have spent their careers playing up this nice guy, loyal to their franchise image. Giannis was literally the subject of a Disney movie and loves acting like Hakeem from coming to America at press conferences. Just in awe of all the amazing things this country has to offer. Wow, a smoothie, a Chick-fil-A, wow. Dame, Mr. I'm not running from the grind, kept talking about how he was built different than other stars. He was going to stay in Portland and lose. No super team for him. Go ahead, Paul George and KD. Dame has pride. Until he didn't. But then he had portrayed himself as Mr. Loyal for so long that he couldn't even figure out how to force a trade properly. It only happened because Giannis, who prior to the summer coupled every quote about how amazed he was with everything he ever saw with a proclamation about loving Milwaukee and staying there forever and ever, suddenly decided he wasn't so happy there if they couldn't win. Perhaps other cities had cheese and beer and smoothies. But the worst similarity between these two is employing relatives to play shitty professional basketball. I've covered the Nasus plenty, but Dame actually got a worse player a contract simply because they were related. Dame's cousin, Kelgen Blevins, might legitimately be the worst player to ever play in the NBA. He played two awful seasons for the Trailblazers. He played college ball at Southern Miss and Montana State, and over his college career, he averaged eight points and four rebounds on just under 40% from the field and 23% from three. Find me another player who has played in the NBA with those college stats. Okay, but what if he improved? Plenty of guys get better after college. Okay, let's look at what he did last year in Romania. I mean, a former NBA player should dominate there, right? Huh, looks like he got cut after putting up an incredible five points and three rebounds. I could do that right now. If Adam Silver had any heart, He'd put in a rule that forced the Bucks to field a roster with Dame, Giannis, and all of their family members only. If they're good enough to get roster spots and NBA paychecks, then lead them to a championship. But he won't, at least not this season. So let's take a look at their eye test and see if the Bucks have 2024 NBA title vision. Of course they do. Look at this team. Not even Thanasis can stop them. I'm excited to see how it goes. Chris Middleton's health is going to be the determining factor in how hard it is, but they still have enough even if he isn't who he used to be. I kind of want to see them be the villains of the league, especially Dame and Giannis. They've been nice guys for so long. Let's get a heel turn in there. Like I said, the recipe is there for it, particularly with their role players. Go nuts. Anyways, that will do it for the Beyond the Arc with Brandon Silver's Central Division eye test. Make sure you check out the rest of the previews as well. And don't forget to like, subscribe, rate, review, and share. And I will catch you later.